Well, good morning, everybody, and it's good to be back. We were on the East Coast in South Carolina, in Myrtle Beach, and um, we had a, a very wonderful time there. Uh, wonderful in the sense that we had a, a company of people that were ready to hear everything we had to say. We even had one couple come um, all the way from Portland, Oregon, to the meetings in Myrtle Beach. That blows my mind. Um, we had others from Ohio and Atlanta. And um, we really have to go back to the East Coast and have a retreat um, because there's a lot of people there that are um, very, very hungry. It was a very special time for us. <clears throat> COVID stopped all of our traveling. Uh, the week that COVID really began to be acknowledged, um, I lo in one week I lost a year of bookings, and um, it's never really picked up since. And so this was really, and it's not altogether true, we were in Alvin, Texas, just one weekend a little while ago, but this was really the first time we were back traveling on the road and meeting some of you guys. But also, um, it was the first time that Cheryl and I traveled on the road, and um, it was different, I mean gloriously different, to have um, sharing the ministry together and to have Cheryl there to minister, pray, and say the words that God gave her to give. It was a very, very exciting time for us both. And um, then we went to the uh, graduation of Cheryl's grandson, and that had some very interesting times when persons who had no idea uh, of the gospel in any way, sense, or fashion, uh, looked straight at me across the room and said, so what do you talk about? What is your message? Well, shucks, I had to tell them, you know. <laughs> um, and, um, and I had the whole room listening. It was a, that in itself was a very wonderful thing. And so it's good to be back. And... I might as well tell you now while I'm talking, that on August the 3rd, which is not too far away, I'm going to get a brand new kneecap made of steel. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'll be able to walk properly. Anyway, you can hold that in mind. Um, when we met the surgeon the other day, um, he, he was a very wonderful believer. In fact, had been involved in mission work of going to villages in Africa and sharing his abilities for free. And, um, and so, um, if it be possible, I'm looking forward to August the 3rd. <laughs> I've had enough of this knee. It's, um, but also to have a surgeon who is a fellow believer uh, makes it all the better. Okay, I want to share, and I'll, I'll say this ahead of time, as if I don't really need to, but I'll be saying things, I think, that will be new to some people. Uh, as I say, that happens most of the time. But um, the, this touches on evangelism, and that is one of the sacred cows uh, of the, the church in the Western world. And so... Please hear me out. Don't leave because you disagree with me. Um, no, that, that's very true. Anyway, it's in Acts and 26, the Acts of the Apostles and chapter 26. Um, and you'll, you'll find there, Paul is speaking to the uh, Roman governor, Festus, but also to the Jewish um, sort of puppet king called Agrippa, Herod Agrippa. And um, 
as he's talking, he, he shares something that he doesn't share anywhere else. So he tells his usual story, which we're getting used to by Acts 26, when he says, On the Damascus road a light brighter than the sun, and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul. We've heard that from when it happened in chapter 9. He keeps on giving his testimony. But this time, he adds something to it. Uh, and whether it actually happened on the road to Damascus, as it sounds, or whether he's compressing this as he's talking to these dignitaries, and maybe it happened over the next number of weeks or even months. But um, here it is in verse um, 17 at the end, the Lord says to him, I am sending you, and this is, I'm sending you, this is my mandate to you, this is your commission, I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. That was his commission. And I don't know if you've heard what I just read, but that's very different to how we understand what the gospel does and what we're supposed to do. And so I just want to look at it. Um, there, there's stuff there that should be said. I haven't heard anyone else say it, so I thought I'd have a go and say it. Open their eyes. Now, now think about it slowly. Open their eyes. That means, and it's pretty obvious, up until that moment, their eyes are shut. Mm -hmm. That doesn't take too much to think. That he is commanded to go and open eyes that were already shut. And that is a, uh, an expression in the scripture to open eyes means that a person can see. If their eyes are shut, it means they're blind. That's just an expression in the languages of the Bible. And so he's saying the people you're going to are blind, their eyes are shut. And if your eyes are shut and you're blind, especially in the biblical sense of the world, you are in a profound darkness. And I always use the word profound because, and I want to emphasize this, when we say blind, we think of persons physically blind. And persons physically blind are well aware of a reality that they can't see. And as I've said before, many times a person who is physically blind can see more than I can. That they have a sense of that other reality and they can make connection to it. When the Bible speaks of blindness, the only way I can put it is a profound blindness. That is, it is a blindness that has no concept of a reality beyond the darkness in which they find themselves. They are in the dark. It's a blindness that has totally lost the, the, the seeing of who God really is. And in that darkness, there is a twisted, distorted image of God that has been birthed in the imagination of the darkness. So when I say God to a person in the darkness, I have no idea what they think by that expression. Um, when we say God and you see, then it's, it's a totally different thing. We have seen and we've seen who God really is. But that is not necessarily what a person in the darkness means when they talk about God. They are in a profound darkness. They can't connect with reality. Uh, and so it is. Um, it it's, uh, have no idea of who we are. The blind blindness darkens us to our own identity. Um, it isn't only I don't know who God is, but I don't know who I am. And sometimes that actually comes out. A person will admit they don't know who they are. 
don't know where they're going. They're, they're admitting that they're in a profound darkness in which they have no map of the future. They have no idea of purpose or meaning to life. And they don't know who they are in relation to a God, whoever he may be. It's darkness. And also then, of course, that means I don't see you as you really are. I see you through the lens of my own darkness. And I actually make things up about you and think it's the truth. Um, and you're making things up about me. And we'll have a war over what we think about each other. Uh, because we're all in this darkness. Now, this is not a unique scripture um, to, to where we read. It seems sometimes most of the Bible is, is around this idea. Um, maybe 2 Corinthians 4 uh, really says it. It says, even if our gospel is veiled, and that word veiled is not the best translation the word veiled there means like skin is on my body. That is, you cannot see the organs of my body because it's veiled. That, that's the biblical word. It's got a skin on it. Um, the bark of a tree, they use this word to describe the bark of a tree. You can't see the trunk of the tree because there's a bark that, using this word, veils it. That's the meaning of this word. And so he says, our gospel is veiled. That is, there is something between your eyes and the gospel that causes, I can't see the gospel any more than at this moment you can see my lungs. You can't, it's, they're veiled. And, and so Paul is saying, you cannot see, you cannot see the gospel because it is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing. That's an unfortunate translation there. The word perishing there is exactly, exactly the same as the word used elsewhere in the Gospels as lost. So when he says the lost sheep, that's the same word, only this time they translate it perishing. Perishing has um, got a finality to it, uh, whereas lost means you, you are precious, you're in deadly danger right now, but we've got hope. We're looking for you. And, um, and so he says, it's veiled to those who are presently lost, in whose case the God of this world, and that um, doesn't always mean in the sense of a demon or a Satan. It means the God of this world, the culture of this world, the, the way this world understands and thinks there's, there's a, a darkness power behind it that actually blinds your mind. When we go out into the world, we are meeting people who are completely blind to truth because of politics, because of culture, because of, and you add to the list, it's what the kids are taught in school. They're being taught the veil. They're being taught the God of this world. Uh, we open the newspaper, we listen to CNN, even Fox and the rest of them. All you hear is the veil that is holding back from the truth. The God of this world has blinded the minds. So veil equals blinded minds. There, there, there are parallel ideas there. Blinded the minds. Uh, and that, that's the horrific truth of what this is about. Your, your mind, that's the point. Um, the, the Bible does not speak of sin as a nature. It rather speaks of it as a mind gone crazy. Uh, and uh, I refer to that as we go on. Um, but it's blinded the mind. That, that's terrible because the mind is where you think. The mind is where you weigh truth. The mind is where you make behaviors. And he says, the mind has been blinded. You don't have a clue what's going on. So that they might not see. Of course, the, the God of this world has blinded their minds so they will not see the light of the gospel, of the glory of God in Christ. For the God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shone into our hearts 
to give the light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so he said, this world is in a state of darkness, a profound darkness. The mind is blinded. They can't see the gospel. But the God who said, light be, has said light into our hearts, which is the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Blindness. That's our problem. Blindness. Um, well, it doesn't matter what form sin takes. You're gonna, if you, you're honest about it and you're not reading out of a denominational handbook, you soon recognize the problem here is blindness. And they can't see. There's no good shouting at them. It's, it's no use uh, demeaning them. Or, they can't see. And they, they, they can't see at a very deep level. It's not just these eyes, it's the blindness of the mind. So I can't appeal to their logic. I, I can't appeal to what is obvious to us. Their mind, they're blind. And Jesus was the same. I don't know how some people read the Gospels and not sort of hiccup over what they believe. Um, can, can you imagine it today? A woman taken in adultery, and Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What's the matter with him? He's supposed to condemn, isn't he? Isn't that what the gospel is all about, that you condemn people so that they want, you know? And of course, how you get around the entire period of the sufferings of Jesus and the cross, Father, forgive them. Why? because they don't know what they're doing. Would somebody please read that? He doesn't condemn them for seeking to torture and murder God. And he says the reason behind the forgiveness that they can receive is they're doing it in ignorance. They don't have a clue what's going on. Paul testified of his own conversion. In Timothy, he says, even though I, Paul, was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy. Why? Because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. He said, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I thought, in fact, I was serving God. But the truth is that I was blind, I was ignorant, I didn't know. Uh, the, the Greek there is, is very, to read it, just the whole portion there directly from the Greek, it means to be, I was uh, continually ignorant without any experiential knowledge or personal insight. He said, I was blind. And um, he, he, he was on the edge of almost, he'd already let rays of light in, in talking to the people he persecuted, because Jesus said to him, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Oh, no. That is when, when in those days you had a, an oxen and, and it's pulling the plow, but it, it's a, kicks against, he didn't want to do it. And they had a goad, which was a, a stick with a little point on it. So when they kicked back, they kicked into the goad and, and figured it's better I keep moving. And, and Jesus says, you've been kicking against the goad. That is what you've heard up to this point is, it, it, you know it's there and you, you don't know what it is. You're, you're, you're on the edge of sleep and you're desperately trying to stay awake. You, 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 rather the reverse, I'm on the edge of sleep, I want to go to sleep, and yet something keeps, you're, 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 you're on the verge of waking up. But he was ignorant. When he spoke about Israel, the Jewish people in the New Testament, he said, I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. They're just passionate about nothing. Um, for not knowing about God's righteousness. They established uh, their own. 
You, you follow me? They're, they're totally ignorant of what God has done in Christ. They don't know. They're in the dark. So what are they doing in the dark? They're trying to figure out ways that God just might accept me. All wrong, of course. And then the one that I believe is almost central to this in the New Testament in Ephesians 4, it says the Gentiles or the outsiders, they walk in the futility of their mind. There it is. You, you can't move in the New Testament without coming up against this. The problem with humankind is a mind. It's darkened. So here it says in the futility, which means the aimlessness. Futility is I'm walking in circles and I don't know where I'm going. Futility. Um, the, it's interesting, the, the whole New Testament refers to the, their neighbors, the Roman Empire, the, their oppressors, uh, and the New Testament writers refer to that whole scene as futility. Uh, as they go from one party to another party, uh, they, they live their life trying to find something to make them happy, and, and it's, it's futile. Because as soon as you finish one party, you need another one to keep me going. Um, futile. And, and why are you here? I don't know, but you know, we, we go on. Futility, futility. It's also interesting that those Romans who spoke this language, a Greek, but they hardly ever used the word futility about themselves. That they were so sunk in futility, meaningless darkness, that they were darkened to their own emptiness. They were darkened, blind to their own futility. That's how it worked. And it says, so the futility of them are being darkened in their understanding. They've exclu excluded themselves from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Now that all leads to the hardness of their heart, which leads to having become callous and given themselves over to practice. Now we got to behavior. But you can talk to that behavior as long as you want and they won't even understand what's wrong with their behavior because of the futility of their mind, the darkened understanding and the ignorance that is in them. You get that? Yeah. And this, he's talking now uh, from the, all levels from himself as a religious Pharisee to the Roman world of the rich and famous and lords of the earth right down to the scum of the earth. It doesn't, this one, there's no, no, no difference. They're all under this pall of darkness. Now, I want you to understand something. The darkness, the fact I can't see, doesn't change the reality that I can't see. Yeah. You know, you, you are the reality in this room. If I had this profound darkness, I say you're not there. And I've made up another whole scenario of what is there. Well, that, that's sad because you are there. Uh, and, and my blindness doesn't stop you being there. Yeah. You, you follow me? Uh, the, the blindness does not change reality. The blindness disconnects you from reality. It's there, but you don't see it. You don't know it. Your ignorance. And, and so... This is unrighteousness. It, it isn't that these people are doing a list of terrible things. They probably are, but that's not the point. The fact that they are disconnected from reality. They don't see God. They don't understand who he is, which means then I, I'm living in unrighteousness. The, there's no face-to-face -face with God or the way we've talked about it in recent months, it's a terrible forgetfulness. Um, the darkness, as it descended upon the human race, brought with it a terrible forgetfulness. We forget who our original parent is. The, I forgot, you know, in, in Isaiah he says, the ox knows its, um, rather the donkey knows its owner. 
and an ox knows who feeds it. But you've forgotten your parent. You, you've forgotten who God is. And, and, and it, it's, it's a terrible, the only word I can describe it is, is a spiritual dementia. It's, I've forgotten who my father is. You know, I, I don't know. And I look at you and I say, do I know you? Um, and me, I don't know who I am. We're, we're living in this terrible world of darkness, unreality. We're disconnected. That's the way it is. And, and um, to open their eyes means I'll open my eyes and I'll say, it's all new. No, no, no. It's not all new. It's been here since the resurrection. But um, you've just woken up to it. You see, your darkness didn't stop reality being, nor does your faith make it happen. Do you follow? The, this is a different way of looking at it. You say, it's here. Your, your, your faith does nothing except your eyes are now opened to see what is, and, and you, everyone else who's on the inside uh, of this, they give you a, a smile, you know, you're and you're saying, it's so new, it's so new, it's so... Yes, we, we, we understand, you know, you're, you're just getting used to this. You, you suddenly opened your eyes in the middle of a tango, and, and you're saying, what's going on? This is so new, I didn't know there was music, I didn't know there was dancing, I didn't know... No, you didn't, you were asleep on the floor, but you've just woken up. See, you've just woken up. Your, your blindness never affected reality. This is very big. I... I I hear a lot of people almost say, I'm not sure whether they're really saying it, but they, they give the impression, if you believe enough, it, you'll get it. No, you won't. No. The, the, this gospel is not like Tinkerbell in Peter Pan. Do you remember when you were a kid? You were, remember Tinkerbell? Uh, and, and in the pantomimes especially when they were the kids, and they would say, who, believe in Tinkerbell. You've got to believe in Tinkerbell. And then she begins to get light now because she feeds and is fueled by your belief. And if you stop believing in Tinkerbell, she'll die. No. no. God doesn't live fueled by your faith. The finished work of Christ doesn't depend upon how you feel about it. He's not Tinkerbell. He blazes with light whether you believe him or not. And, and so the, the darkness cuts me off from reality. Open eyes means I suddenly discover. But the darkness, I underscore, makes it impossible to see reality. It's a darkness so intense, so intense we don't even think it's darkness. That's the point. That's what makes it so difficult. The darkness is so intense that we, behind our closed eyes, think that darkness is the light. Yeah. In fact, many times we think the light is darkness. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when the light begins to filter through, we fight it, that's darkness. It is and that's the light, but it is absolutely other than everything we've ever thought of. And in that darkness, we're in a slavery. It's a darkness that wraps us like the bark of a tree. And we're wrapped in lies. And within that darkness is the unending talk. The accuser, which is the meaning of the word Satan. It's the accuser. And it is constant. And, and there's nothing more... Um, mind bending than someone who won't stop talking and, and in their talking they're accusing you accusing you and you're wrong and and I can't I can't handle it and it's a it's a voice that's going on inside of me and the trouble is it sounds like my voice so I think that I, I'm, I'm making some supreme judgments about myself but it isn't it's the accuser guilt shame there's no sense of forgiveness and until the pop psychologists tell us, you know, it's very healthy for you to forgive. And so we come up with all these things that got nothing to do with forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Only God could forgive. It's the sleep of death. Because Jesus sometimes addressed death as sleep. In fact, he always did, actually. He said, we go into Lazarus to wake him from his sleep. 
raise him from the dead. That this, this darkness is death, but it is like a sleep of death. And in that sleep, the, the darkness, the imagination it is, um, it, it's, what should I say? It's a nightmare. And when, when you have the nightmare, um, you're, you're seeing things that are not terrifying things. Uh, and the nightmare is um, bringing you all manner of fears that otherwise wouldn't be there. Um, we even sleepwalk and we do things we never remember doing. We don't know. We did, and we never thought it was wrong. We just... There are times when you wake up in sheer terror of what you've seen as you go back to sleep because terror, fear, threats is not the way to wake up. You love wakes you up. Yes. What must I do? to get out of this quagmire of death and this profound darkness. What must I do? Have you ever realized it was doing that got you there in the first place? It's doing that keeps us in the darkness. The darkness is not a bad habit. The darkness is not some chemistry that makes me feel this way. The darkness is the great lie yep. that you're the center of the universe. <laughs> and then we look at all of life through that lie producing insane behavior. What must you do? <laughs> Let's face it, humankind is a disabled in spirit and mind. Can't do it. How can you deliver yourself when you're immersed in the darkness? Especially when the darkness is the only reality that you know. How can you get out of it? And so the Bible says he loves darkness rather than light. And of course, the religious person is in much worse situation than the man on the street. Uh, do you remember Jesus said, you've got to have new wineskins for new wine. And he says, you, you taste the new wine, you say it's better. But do you remember the last phrase of that parable he gave? He said, but some of you, you always say the old is better. That is, I don't want the new wine and I don't want the new wineskin. The old is better. That's blindness. You're tasting the new covenant and you spit it out and you say it tastes like mud. Let's go back to the old. No. Blindness confuses us. Of course, the Hebrew says the old, which is the law, is already finished by the time he wrote Hebrews. He said, it's already finished. In fact, it is ready to be torn up and thrown away. The new covenant is so new. There's nothing you bring in from the old to help it. It's a new wine skin for new wine. And the darkness says, give me the old. G give me the law which only can minister death. Darkness. That's how, how it all started. Satan's lie in the Garden of Eden. He said, if you do this, your eyes will be opened. Mm -hmm. Huh? The moment they did it, their eyes slammed shut. And that was the beginning. So what can open my eyes? That's a big question, if you've really heard what I'm saying. Got to take more than a magic prayer. It's going to take, when I was in Bible school, boy, some of you won't believe me when I say this, but it's true. Probably the best kept secret in Bible schools. But, but the, the class on evangelism was really taken from how they trained insurance agents to sell insurance. 
and, and and the whole thing was you know you you bring them to it you, what do you want what do you want what do you want and then close the sale and don't leave until they've said that prayer you see I'll shut up there because I won't trust myself to what I'll say after yeah. that. Yeah. That is not evangelism that borders on blasphemy. It's only the gospel. Paul said, in, we read it in Corinthians, that the, the, um, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, that's the gospel. And that opens eyes, and then the, he shines into our hearts the truth. Um, and so, Paul was commissioned, go and open their eyes. There's nothing can take place until their eyes are opened. You can lecture all you want, all the philosophical ideas, and build a whole church, but nothing's going to happen until you open their eyes. But of course, the fact he said open their eyes is hope. It, it means that I, who am so entangled in darkness, I can't find my way out. But he's telling me there is opening their eyes, which means there is hope in a hopeless world. My blindness can be healed yes. and the darkness can give way to light and I can see reality. I can have my eyes opened. So in announcing the gospel, that's where eyes begin to open. How do you pronounce the gospel? How can I say this? Promise me you won't take one word out of this. Listen to the whole thing. Announcing the gospel does not begin with the incarnation. It doesn't begin with the life of Jesus. It doesn't begin with his sufferings. It doesn't begin with his blood shedding or the cross or his burial. That by itself would change nobody. Have you ever noticed? Very few people even knew of his birth and at the beginning. Uh, most of the people that hung around him for 30 years thought he was a peasant carpenter. Didn't change them at all. There's no light. Even in his ministry, he said, who do people say that I am? And really the answer was, we don't have a clue. Uh, where only Peter caught the revelation, you are the Christ. But for the most part, they could bathe in the wonder of what he was doing, but they didn't understand a thing. Those who tortured and would murder him, they certainly didn't have a clue what they were doing. In fact, the scripture says if they had known, they would never have done it, but they were blind. And when I come into the Acts, it's fascinating to me, they didn't begin with any of that. The gospel that changed everything was the resurrection. And that's where in the gospels they began. They, they didn't say Jesus died for you. What does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean to a person in the darkness? Jesus died for you. Well, yeah. British and American troops died for me in World War II. What's the deal? That's not the gospel. There is no meaning to his death. It, it's the biggest despair, the biggest failure. He dies on a cross. That's not the gospel. It's the resurrection that now changes how I understand that. And the resurrection then investigates his life and says, now I know who he was. And then I could hear it. He's the incarnate son of God. Yes. But until the resurrection, none of that means a thing. Yeah. The resurrection. In the gospel, you, you tell it backwards. You start with the end and go backwards. Because it's the end that is the key 
do everything. And I'm not going to stop here, but I find it terribly, what, not only frustrating, but I, I see the fingerprints of Satan all over it, that the one part of Christian celebration that has been so twisted and distorted is resurrection. Have you noticed, I mean, the whole weekend is Resurrection Sunday. That's what it's all about. But what do we call it? Easter. You do know the name Easter is that of a pagan goddess that in the Old Testament is called Baal and Asherah. And it's been called Easter. And then one of the greatest liturgies of Asherah and Yestra, the, the two pagan god demon goddesses, their greatest thing to get children was a rabbit. And a rabbit that laid magic eggs. Wow. That came straight out of the demonic pagan goddesses of Europe. And it was brought over here by German immigrants who brought their European goddesses with them. And every church I turn. Resurrection? There's no, no kid, no child growing up in a church in America thinks of resurrection as Jesus rising from the dead. It's rabbits and Easter eggs. Straight out of Easter's bag of demonic tricks. I say no more, um, except that there is no gospel but for the resurrection. The, the resurrection. Have you noticed also the celebration, if you can call it that, uh, of the passion and sufferings of Jesus. The people that will study his sufferings and weep over them and sentimentalize them. His sufferings, his sufferings. Jesus suffered. So then he died. That's it. Finished. Done. They hardly celebrate resurrection. They don't know where it fits. There's only one gospel, and that is he rose from the dead. Now I understand his sufferings. If he rose from the dead, there's certainly not what it looked like. Well, I've said my thing. In fact, the resurrection changed the nature of sin. Again, ask most Christians what is sin, and they will say, break in the Ten Commandments. Would somebody please announce that Jesus came? Um, <laughs> That is Old Testament, Old Covenant, Old Law. Tear it up, throw it away. We're done with that. Jesus redefined sin. He said the Holy Spirit will convince the world of sin. And of course, most commentaries stop there. Um, preach a whole message about breaking the Ten Commandments. But Jesus didn't. He said, of sin, because they believe not on me. Sin is not breaking the Ten Commandments. Jesus dealt with sin. Yeah. Finished. He shouted it. It is finished. He rose from the dead. The resurrection is the receipt on a finished work. Mm. He did it. He finished it. Well, that you try and believe that as thousands of people right now are trying, they're trying to believe that. And I was crucified with Christ. Boy, isn't that easy to believe? I'm trying to take my brain that's already in the twilight zone and I push it back and push it back and push it back until it disappears into the mist and try and believe that back there somewhere I was included in Christ and when he died, I died, he rose, I rose. I've got to believe that. That's what they say. No, you, you cannot stand in the sufferings of Christ and try and believe. Yeah. It's when I meet with Jesus who is alive yes. and can actually communicate with me through the Holy Spirit. That's when my eyes are opened. 
And there's no eyes opened if all I've got is Christian philosophy that's based on his sufferings and death and what a wonderful person he was. And no. See, the, the religious kept all the commandments, kept every one of them. I mean, it was a surface keeping. There was plenty you could comment about it, but at least on the surface, they kept the commandments. In fact, they added to them to make sure they would be really done properly. Yeah. <laughs> and yet, they remained in their darkness. In fact, Jesus said, because you say, I see, you're in the dark. It's because you believe that what you're doing causes you to see, causes you to not only remain in darkness, but get into it even deeper. It's the resurrection. Paul, in all probability, had heard Jesus speak. It's very possible, I can't prove it, but it's very possible if you put the chronology of Paul's life together that he could have been there when Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. He could have. Could have been there when Jesus spoke directly to the Pharisees. What did that do to Paul? Nothing. You, you follow me? All it did is cause him to get angry, angry enough to kill and torture Christians. Didn't. You've got to understand this, this what, ha what makes new covenant new? The new covenant is not the law on steroids. It isn't that Jesus said, well, we keep the Ten Commandments and I just throw in another one, you know, love one another. No, the law ended. Old cannot come with new. There's no mixture. As I said weeks ago, agape and eros cannot be mixed. What you get is a monster. The old is over. All it can do is point to the new, but point with hopelessness because it doesn't know how to get there. And suddenly we burst into the new. And the new is so other than the old. I understand the Pharisees didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know. And they listened to Jesus. They didn't understand him. They looked at his miracles and they couldn't define it. They looked at the cross and they said, well, that's over, that's got rid of him. Only, only when Jesus rose from the dead, everything changed. And prior to that, nothing had changed. In Acts 26, 23, this is what Paul, now Paul's preaching. He says that the Christ, the Messiah, was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light. Not his teaching. People say, I live by the Sermon on the Mount. Don't be daft. You've never read it if you say you can live it. Um, we, you don't live by the Sermon on the Mount. We don't live by the Ten Commandments. We don't live even by his sufferings. We don't live even by his death. It says, by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he's the first to proclaim the light. And that light, Isaiah 49 says, I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. It's not the, it's not the teachings of Jesus that reach to the end of the earth. It's not the teachings that bring light. It's the unspeakable message that one who embraced our darkness, embraced our death, rose from the dead, and in so doing brought light bigger than the darkness. Isaiah 42. The Father is speaking to Jesus there. He says, I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. I'm sending you to open blind eyes, bring out prisoners from the dungeon. 
those who dwell in darkness from the prison. And that's what Jesus came to do. Isaiah 60, arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The Lord will rise upon you and his glory appear upon you. Nations will come to your light. Kings to the brightness of your rising. It's light, 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 light. Open eyes, open eyes. That's what it's about. And that light was the resurrection. Through the resurrection, we realize now, plainly, he's God incarnate. Only God could do that. Only God can forgive sins. Through the resurrection, we understand his sufferings and his death. They have meaning, they have purpose now. In fact, in Romans 1, it says, The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets regarding his son, who as to his humanity was a descendant of David, but who through the Holy Spirit was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. That is, when they looked at Jesus making doors and windows in a carpenter's shop, you say he's the Son of God there. Never even thought about it, dismissed it. When he halfways mentioned it, they said, who do you think you are? No, nothing. See Jesus hanging on the cross? And you say he's the son of God? I, I can understand logically. A person in the darkness, I can understand laughing at him and saying, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. Nobody believed. No one could understand. It was still in the dark until resurrection. When he came out of the tomb, having reversed death, this isn't just raising Lazarus from the dead, because Lazarus rose from the dead and died a few years later. Resurrection is not resuscitation. Resurrection means he reversed death. He reversed the whole tendency of the human race, which is down into death and nothingness. Do you, do you realize we're talking here about the greatest expression of power, greater than creation, mm -hmm. creation was calling forth life out of nothing. Resurrection is reversing death and calling forth life out of everything that was anti-life. It's far, far greater than creation. It's, it's the greatest event that's ever taken place in the universe. Resurrection. And the best we can do is let a rabbit loose. It, yeah. Jesus said, he placed his right hand on me, said John, saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end all at the same moment. I am the living one or livingness itself, source of life. I was dead. And look, behold, I am alive to the ages of ages. I have the keys of death and Hades. Yes. And I don't know if you know the word Hades, which is commonly translated as hell, but Hades, the, in the Greek, the H at the beginning of the word means a negative. And so Hades is from I, I see, I grasp, I understand. Hades, Hades means I'm blinded, I don't understand, I don't get it. I'm drowning in darkness. Jesus said he went inside our darkness. He went inside our deepest, profound blindness. And he is the light of the cosmos. 
That's the resurrection. You ran out of words, you see. You, what was it? How could it happen? He stepped into the pit of our death and sin and he forgave us because only God can forgive sin. So in his humanity, he took to himself our humanity, which was his passport into death. Only humans die. Creatures die. God doesn't die. So how does God get into our death? How does he get inside our darkness? He has to become one of us. He has to be born of a woman. It's his passport. He's accepted now as a member of our human race. We got inside. The earliest church, they're a bit raw in how they put it. But, I mean, really seriously early church. They said that God, in the illustration, God disguised himself as a fish. Jesus put on fishness. And Satan was fishing. And he caught the fish. Only when Satan caught the fish, God came out. Satan didn't know what hit him. Because he thought he'd caught a man. And Satan had a right and authority over the human race. So he caught Jesus, and Jesus let himself be caught. And when Satan caught him, he blew hell apart. Because he got inside. I said it's a bit raw, calling it a fish, but you get the picture. He's got the keys of death and Hades. The name of Jesus has been to the pit of darkness and death. And every name connected with darkness and death is terrified of the name of Jesus. I say again, it was the greatest event in the cosmos in all of time and history. Ephesians 1 has a go at translating it. He says uh, um, that you might know what is the surpassing greatness of his power. Now, I, the word there we're looking at is power. But the Holy Spirit adds surpassing. Surpassing means if you stand at that door and I throw you a ball, that's one thing. But if you stand at that door and I throw a ball that goes to the end of the property, that's surpassing. It goes beyond all mind comprehension. He said it's power. That means infinite ability. But he says now I'll add surpassing to that. I'll, I'll take the infinite ability of God which goes beyond anything you can ever imagine. And by the way, that's not enough. Let's add greatness. The surpassing greatness of his infinite ability. But then he says, that's not enough. He says, these are in accordance with the working. Working in the Greek language is energia. The almighty energy of God. Of the strength, that's back to the word power. And of his might, that's the word kratos in Greek, which is used for God's power that made the universe. And he said, he put all, all that together. And he brought it about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Every power word known in any language came together. And he reversed death. To even think about that, you would have to be a quantum scientist. Seriously. Because quantum scientists have thought about that. And they said, for that to happen, the universe would stop being. And only because he actually did rise, did it come back together again. Because to reverse death, to reverse the way we understand existence, would bring about the collapse of the universe. But he rose, which means 
He turned it around, reversed it, and then was the life of it. We're not living in the same universe, you know, as... No. And that's the receipt. Did you know you got the receipt? There's a receipt that, behold, the Lamb of God who took away your sin. That's not just a platitude. I've got the receipt. My sin has gone. I am pronounced not guilty. I am brought into the covenant family of God. I've been, I've been adopted, placed into God's family. Huh. And I've got the receipt. He rose from the dead. And I know he rose from the dead because within me he witnesses to me it is so. See, the law never did that. The best it could do was make a few Gentiles sort of hungry for a better life. And so they sat at the back of the synagogue and want to become Jews. Nothing. But when this happened, eyes open now see the light. And what's the first thing they see? The finished work of Christ. It's the gospel. Good news, good news of great joy. I bring to you and to all. That was right at the, at the birth of Jesus. This is it. The incarnate God, who is love, who died, is risen, conquered death. And that's the light. Because if he rises from the dead, it means he conquered that which began death. In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. They ate it, they died. But the fullness of that death waited until Jesus came to be fulfilled. He entered into the death of death. So what's death about? Why is death there? Sin. Separating oneself away from the source of life. What's it about? Condemnation, shame, hiding, darkness, masks, secrets. Suddenly the light comes and exposes the whole jolly thing. Nothing's hidden, nothing's secret. The God who is transparent, <laughs> true to himself, being who he is, has revealed himself in the one who not only became us, but as us destroyed death. We can understand it all. And in his light, okay, they've opened my eyes now. I've got the news. One has come that has crushed and finished and done with that which caused me to be blind in the first place. Yes. And so my eyes are opened. And what's the first thing I see? I see that what I call darkness was light. Yes. Only I see that now in the light of light. And the light tells me I'm beloved, I'm died for, I'm risen for. So I, it's safe now to look at my darkness. Because yes. I know it's been defeated. I remember who my parent is. I remember that you're my brothers and sisters. I know who I am. The light of the world. He accomplished the goal. And then he said, you go and open their eyes. You go. I thought we were to have a prayer meeting and pray that God would save people. Oh, are you blind? Are you deaf? I've just told you, he saved us. That's reality. I need my eyes opened to see that. I don't pray that God do what he did in Christ. It's done. My trouble is I can't see it. Our prayer meeting should be, oh Lord, open his eyes. 
and stop weeping and whining over your children and just pray, God, open their eyes. That's what he told you to do. Open their eyes. Jesus said at the end of Matthew, all authority is given to me in heaven and upon earth. Wow, we're going to sit back and watch this show. No, he says, therefore, you go and teach the nations. I've done it. It's finished. And I'm privileging you to be a partner with the Holy Spirit to open their eyes. Because your eyes have been opened, now go and open theirs. Paul thought about that and laughed. He said, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Yes, I'm doing it. I'm opening your eyes. By preaching. Isn't that daft? You would expect at least a flash of lightning, something like that, you know, by preaching. Ezekiel sawed the bones, and the Lord said, can these bones live? Ezekiel says, Lord, you know, don't ask me. The Lord says, then preach to the bones. Yeah. I feel like that many times. It's, it's impossible. It's stupid. You're announcing to a boneyard that really in the eyes of God, they're a mighty army of resurrection. Okay, I'll do it. And he says, while I preach, there was a click and a clack and a bang. Uh, bones came together. Yes. But even I can't take it beyond that. The Lord says, Call on the Spirit. Tell the Spirit to do His work. And there came the wind of God and they stood upon their feet a mighty resurrected army. We are the ambassadors of Christ, said Paul. We're sent into darkness with the authority, the Holy Trinity. Another time Paul says, we are workers together with Christ. And of course, you are the light of the world. You do know that. Just I just said Jesus was. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm in you. He's in me. He's the light of the world. He did say, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. It's interesting. When he ascended, he says, it's, you're now the light of the world. Go and open their eyes. You go and open their eyes. Hmm. And our audience is not only those in darkness we sort of can see and define. The darkness is with society the matter. It's a weird darkness. Actually, it's a deeper darkness. Because I, I meet people all the time that they understand enough. The light comes and they see it's free. It's God's grace. It's his gift. And I take it but immediately they put that aside I've got to earn the rest and so that which I receive for free I try to work out with an endless list of rules and <sighs> yeah we talk to those people too they're very much in the dark no it's open their eyes Holy Spirit through our lips and emphasize, that's not poetry. I mean it. Yeah. Outside of your lips and my lips, the Holy Spirit has chosen to do nothing. Now, your lips may be in declaring the gospel and the light in the presence of the Father here mm -hmm. about people who live a thousand miles away. Mm -hmm. That was your lips, only working at a different level than eyeball to eyeball. But we do it. He does it. Because you'll never understand the gospel. You'll never understand the scripture outside of the Holy Spirit. Scripture without the revelation of the Spirit will end you up saying, I ought, I should, I must. But with the revelation of the Spirit, it says, I am, I am, and I am becoming. I've seen myself in Christ. Eyes opened. And those eyes open now are commanded by Jesus himself to look at us. 
He says, love one another and the world will know that I came. It's, it's interesting. That was the one thing they left out of the evangelism course. From beginning to end of John, especially John, he says that the way the world will know, number one is because they see your love for one another, and the second thing in John 17, it says they will know because they see your union in Christ. And they see that you live, not you, he lives in you. It's only after reading your life is the world ready to hear what you're saying. You are what the light looks like. And so we announce the gospel, but first we live it. And that's no big deal. You've seen the light. You respond to the love. Christ is your life. You give your testimony. And the word testimony means do it again. So you testify and the Holy Spirit says, I'll do that again. Yeah. yeah. Huh. The darkness now is a force that has been rendered helpless. Darkness can't stand in your way. Mm -hmm. The name of Jesus, darkness is terrified. Please. This is metanoia. Yeah. Yes, it, is. it is your eyes opened to actually go beyond your mind. The, the metanoia means eyes radically opened. It means to see as you've never seen before. But it also means to go beyond your mind, which is weird for a meaning of a Greek word. But um, in, in 1 Corinthians 2, it defines it. It says, you now have the mind of Christ. You've gone beyond your mind. You have the mind of Christ. That's metanoia, which is the word I think all of you know um, has been wickedly translated as repent, which is a Roman Catholic word which means to do penance over and over and over and over again, like every Sunday night. But um, that's not the meaning of the word, metanoia. This opening of the eye, I've seen it. And you see, when you see it, faith is part of the seeing. Yeah. When I've seen it, I, I can accept it. I believe it, I rest in it, I've seen it. If you haven't seen it, your faith it comes out of self-help books. You know, say it enough and hopefully it will work. Well, this is... And it's the goodness of God that leads you to metanoia. Yes. No threats, no fear, no bludgeoning you. Just God's love keeps hammering at you. And it brings you to light, opening of the eyes. So awake you who are asleep and Christ shall give you life. There it is again. There's another word. We've referred to it. I didn't give you the word in Hebrew, um, but we've talked about it before. Teshuva. Teshuva means to turn from where I'm at to return to where I left the path. Yeah, Teshuva. T E S U. V A um, T E S H U V A Teshuva. Um, he restores my soul. That's Teshuva. He restores me. He takes me back to where I left the path. It, it's it's light that causes me to understand where I'm at. I I and again I can look at the darkness now without fear, because I saw the light first. And the light destroys the darkness. And, and so it, it means teshuva. It means um, I, I come to awareness. I, I'm, I belong to the light. That's my home. And, and I, I was lured away from that. But now I've seen the ultimate someone. The one who has the keys of Hades. 
and I can see my eyes are opened. So I return home. That's another meaning of teshuva, to return home. And I come to the Father with his open arms. And I come with all my doubts and fears and say I'm no longer worthy to be so, but I'm drowned in his love, teshuva. Um, the entire mandate given to Paul and to us is to go and open their eyes. Saul sees on the Damascus Road. What does he see? A risen Jesus, which immediately redefined everything he knew about Jesus. Seeing Jesus alive means that the entire world is turned upside down. No, because you don't get that with the philosophy. You don't get that with a religious bunch of doctrines. That will affect a few people, good or bad. But the resurrection, where you've got no... See, if you take all the religions of the world, this gospel is the only, if you're going to make a comparison, which you can't really, but if you do, the gospel is the only, the only religion in the world that has a savior. No, every other religion has a philosophy from a dead teacher. And certainly, it goes without saying, the gospel is the only announcement being made in the world that the origin of this gospel, he is still with us today and still is in conversation with us today, radically changing our minds light and so and does it ever <laughs> when the lights were turned on we talked about this a few weeks ago the lights were turned on everything that paul had counted his wealth his law keeping his ritual he said i now i now see reality that it's a pile of manure you know strong language See, this is not the icing on the cake of your life. This is a new cake. You, you know, religion gives you an icing, it hides the cake. The gospel destroys the cake. Gives you a new life, new life. And of course, it doesn't stop there. Paul prayed for believers at the eyes of their understanding. We, we are born with born our eyes are half open we we've come to the light we've seen the light we we we've, we believe we've seen everything but um there's a lot more for the holy spirit to keep on opening your eyes and um so there it is we're we are part of the ongoing adventure of the light dawning in our hearts and we participate in his faith yes. to open the eyes of the world around us. Yeah. The God who commanded light to shine out of darkness yes. has shone into our hearts, yes. given us that, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Yes. That's the new covenant. Yes. Nothing to do with that tawdry bunch of rags that is laid over from the old covenant to which they've called it christianity but it's not amen amen, amen. amen. so stay with us we'll be with the holy communion in just a moment and of course now the holy communion makes sense because when when it began when jesus started he said this is the blood the new covenant just shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins i mean face it there was not a person at that table that had a clue what he was saying yeah. that this is my blood of the new covenant which immediately means the old one's over and that blood is for the forgiveness of sins don't know the moment he rose from the dead, that suddenly makes sense. 
And what we're going to do in a moment is a covenant that arose out from not only his blood shedding, but the resurrection, and the Holy Spirit making it reality. So Andrew's going to come and we're going to celebrate together.